Shadi Hamid, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Asha. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's a conversation that in one form or another we've had sometimes publicly and uh, many times privately uh, over the years. Um, uh, you know, we agree on something important, which is that the core of our political system of liberal democracy really consists in two elements that don't always go together, that there is a kind of democratic element of uh, collective self-determination and a kind of liberal element of individual rights and freedoms, and that those two things can can come apart. And that, that I think, is a premise that, that we agree on. Um, you sort of give a clear priority to one of those values over the other. You think that in circumstances where we can't have both, it'd be nice to have both, but in circumstances where we can't have both, we really should go with democracy over liberalism. Is that broadly right? And and what's what's the reason for that? Yeah, sure. So when the two are in tension, as they increasingly are, at some point you have to make a choice. You have to decide what you're going to prioritize. And because I have a darkened view of human nature and I don't believe that good things go together, I don't believe that we can have too many good things simultaneously. So there has to be some kind of decision that we make. And that's a really personal decision about what what we hold dear, what values we want to emphasize over others. And I I don't see another option. So either either we prioritize small L liberalism over small D democracy or the reverse. If you take my premise, of course, that sometimes these two concepts are in tension or diverge. And I think that we both agree on that. So then the next step is what do you do about that divergence? Because um, if it's happening all across the world and we're not just talking, I, in my book, I focus on democratic dilemmas in the Middle East, which I think were quite stark, especially during the Arab Spring. And that's where I think a lot of a lot of people got their first taste of how liberalism and democracy don't go together, specifically because religiously oriented parties, Islamist parties like the Muslim Brotherhood came to power through free elections in a country like Egypt. But that had been going on for a while in the Middle East. Um, eight, the 89 elections in Jordan where the Muslim Brotherhood there did extremely well. The 1991 elections in Algeria where an Islamist party was on the verge of coming to power, but then the secular military um, launched a coup to prevent that. 1995 in Turkey, where the Islamist party there came to power, but then there was a coup um, af afterwards. Um, 2006 with Hamas coming to power through elections. So in some ways, the Middle East was at, you know, was at the vanguard of the divergence. And now it's become a more universal phenomenon. And we see it in recent elections, um, Italy, Sweden, um, Brazil, you name it, India, Israel. So um, you know, it's something that, and you know, citizens really do have to think about and they have to make a choice because it probably will affect their own country if it hasn't already. Um, so before I launch into my devastating critique of your point of view, <laughs> uh, I, I want to I bring more elements of it on the table. Um, uh, so uh, uh, part of your concern, especially relative to the Middle East, is that historically the choice that the U.S. government has made is to, uh, as you would put it, choose liberalism over democracy, that they would choose, uh, you know, these military regimes that have a kind of secular basis or dictators that uh, promised at least to uphold some form of religious pluralism um, uh, or at least to limit the sort of power of uh, 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 Islamist movements and parties. And so they said, look, these are going to be more reliable partners to us geopolitically. Perhaps we even have some normative preference for how they govern a country that's probably secondary. And so we're actually going to be quite skeptical of democratic movements. Is that is, is, is that fair? Yeah, I think the U.S. has a terrible record on this, especially in the Middle East. And the Middle East stands out as an exception, because if you look at the post-Cold War period, the U.S. did get better in promoting democracy in other regions of the world. I mean, after supporting right-wing anti-communist dictatorships in Latin America in the 60s, 70s, we start to see pressure on these autocrats in the 80s. And then the U.S. does facilitate proper democratic transitions um, in that region, but also in Asia, Philippines, um, South Korea, and so forth. 
And that's why for me, the Middle East has always, it's been a source of frustration that the U.S. did get better, except in in um, except in the region that I've spent a lot of time living in and and focusing on. And you pointed to a number of the reasons that U.S. administrations have been skeptical and even sometimes opposed to democracy in the Middle East. I mean, part of it has to do with the discomfort around the the role of religion in public life. I think, especially for secular elites. It's hard for them to really feel comfortable with Islamist parties. They're just very foreign from a cultural and religious standpoint. But also there is an interesting way in which ideology and interests come together. So these Islamist parties are also anti-Israel. They are against U.S. hegemony in the region. So um, it's a mixture of these different factors. And I really come hard on the Obama administration in the book. And I try to reconstruct the events leading up to the coup in Egypt in 2013. And my argument is that. So the coup um, in Egypt, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was after the Tahrir Square revolution, after uh, Hazim Mubarak was pushed out of office, there was free elections, which Muslim Brotherhood won. And then there was a coup by the military against that revolution. And that, that's yeah. what we're talking about in this context. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah, July 2013. And as it so happens, liberal elites in Egypt were vociferous supporters of the coup. And then there was also a massacre after the coup a month later in which a thousand Muslim Brotherhood supporters were killed over the course of the day. And, you know, some of it's personal in the sense, you know, I'm, I'm born, raised in the U.S., but my parents um, immigrated from Egypt. My extended family is mostly still in Egypt, and most of them are what you would call westernized secular elites. And I saw how they supported the coup and also the massacre because they saw the rise of a religious party as being such a threat to their understanding of what Egypt was. And um, they couldn't get past that existential tenor. So they said, well, you know, democracy is nice in theory. But if this is what it means in practice, if it means that there could be changes on, um, you know, issues relating to gender, women's rights, uh, minority rights, those were things that they were uh, very concerned about. And so they made their choice. Um, not to say that liberals everywhere um, are likely to support a military coup against a democratically elected government. But in the Middle East, we have seen by and large liberals and secularists siding with authoritarian regimes because they don't like the outcomes that democracy produces. And that to me is the problem of democracy, so to speak, which is the title of the book, is what do we do when democracy produces bad outcomes? Do we come to terms with those outcomes? How do we process that reality? And uh, so you were focused for for the last couple of points on, on the Middle East, but you said earlier that uh, increasingly other countries are going to face a similar kind of choice. Um, why would that be? Uh, well, uh, yes, you might be familiar with a certain person named Donald Trump. So, <laughs> so there's that. I mean, someone who is, you know, as far as we can tell, is not committed to the classical liberal tradition. I don't think anyone pretends that he is a liberal in that sense of the word. But also I think Sweden and Italy, you know, really stand out as important cases, because I think a lot of folks assume that a country like Sweden would be somewhat immune from a really strong showing from the far right, and not just any kind of right wing populist party, but a party that does have, you know, some neo Nazi roots, we're talking about a proper far right party. And now it's the largest party in the governing coalition, even though it doesn't rule directly in through the cabinet, because it doesn't want to assume too much power too quickly. But still, it is it is extremely influential now in a way that no one would have expected just years ago. In Italy, we might very well have the first democratically elected far right prime minister um, in the post-war period. So it's happening in what, the heart of Western Europe. The countries that we thought were more advanced, had more generous welfare states. We thought that people were relatively content with technocratic management, and apparently they're not at all. So perhaps here we, we come to the crux of our disagreement, and I really look forward to, to getting into this. So 
I think where we agree is that all good things don't naturally go together. So where we agree is that, uh, you know, just because you have democracy, you're not going to have liberalism. Just because you have liberalism, you're not going to have democracy. Um, I think where perhaps we disagree is that, is the assumption that that you seem to have that we can stably have one of those without the other, right? So what you're sort of positing is, uh, well, you know, what America supported in places like the Middle East is a regime of liberalism without real democracy. Um, uh, it's not clear to me how liberal those systems ever were, because after all, people like Hosni Mubarak, um, uh, you know, jailed people and tortured people and violated the most fundamental individual rights in extreme ways. We may have been a little bit better on uh, some counts that can somehow be described as liberalism, like you know, allowing people not to be very religious, or perhaps even allowing some uh, uh, amount of non-Muslim religious worship in the country. But in other ways, they were deeply and extremely illiberal. Um, and by the same token, I guess I'm a little bit skeptical that you can stably have democracy without liberalism. So when you're looking at those uh, kinds of governments you're talking about, whether it's Donald Trump in the United States and the way he tried to transform the country, or you're talking about some of these Islamist movements uh, in the Middle East, um, uh, you know, I agree that when they win elections fair and square, we shouldn't have a coup against them. That, that seems pretty straightforward. But I guess I disagree that actually over time, you're going to be able to sustain democratic regimes that are deeply illiberal um, uh, in which people actually continue to have the ability to vote them out of office. And so for me, uh, you know, the fact that democracy and liberalism don't go together naturally is a sort of tragic fact of politics, but it's actually all the more reason to fight very, very hard against any backsliding on either of them, because democratic backsliding is going to lead to illiberalism and liberal backsliding is going to lead to the end of democracy eventually, because we need individual rights and a free press and independent institutions and all of those kinds of things to make sure, as I often put it, that a democratically elected government can also be removed from office by democratic means. And so I guess, um, uh, you know, why should we think that these deeply illiberal governments are going to continue to be democratic in a meaningful sense? Yeah, well, I'm glad you you raised that objection. It is one that I hear quite a bit. And that's why in the book, I try to make a careful distinction between different kinds of liberalism and illiberalism. So when we say that liberalism and democracy diverge, they diverge in certain ways, but they also still overlap in important ways. And this is where I think nuance and specificity becomes important. I mean, part of what I propose is what I call democratic minimalism. And I try to lay out in detail what that actually means in practice and in theory. So, and there I am trying to decouple these two concepts, but you can't decouple them entirely. So as you sort of alluded to, you need some degree of political liberalism to have free and fair electoral competition. So people need to be able to gather in public squares to hold rallies. They need to be able to communicate their preferences to voters. They have to be able to criticize the ruling party. Um, they have to be able to found new political parties, so on and so forth. Because without those things, then a democratic result will not in fact be representative of the electorate because the electorate wouldn't have had a chance to express and entertain different options and ideas. So at a very basic level, even with my minimalist conception of democracy, you still need some political liberalism. However, on cultural, religious, and social um, liberalism, that I argue you do not need. That is where I think we have to give elected governments more permission to run. And I, to be clear, I don't like that. I wouldn't want to live under an elected government that actually experimented with some of these post-liberal ideas. But um, that's not really for me to say, because if we're talking about religiously conservative societies, I, I'm not I'm not allowed to vote in those countries. I'm only allowed to vote in America. So, you know, it's ultimately up to the electorate. And if you really don't like um, a particularly religious outcome or Islamist outcome, then you do have an option of fighting another day, four years later or five years later at the ballot box. And that actually encourages you 
to make your case to the voters. That's what democracy ultimately does. It for like at the end of the day, if you don't like something, you have to persuade voters that you are the better alternative. And I know a lot of people don't like doing that because it requires talking to deplorables and to the the pious, unwashed masses. And that's where I think that liberal liberal parties, which are increasingly dominated by upper class professional um, elite types um, who are very well educated, sometimes too well educated, they don't necessarily like talking to the masses and persuading them to to join their side. And just just and I'll here. So here's an example of a distinction. If if a government um, restricted protests of over 100 people, that would be a violation of political liberalism, and it would affect the fairness of democratic competition. But if you think about an elected government that restricted the right to consume alcohol, that restricted abortions, that introduced laws on blasphemy as it relates to insulting prophets and divine texts, or um, an elected government that made it harder for women to initiate divorce proceedings, those might be objectionable and even morally abhorrent to us, but they don't violate a minimalist conception of democracy. So I'm very much in favor of making that clear distinction. And that's a way to order the conversation so we don't conflate ideas together. And you see this sometimes, you know, for example, in our own context in America, where people say, oh, um, restricting abortion is part of the anti-democratic activity of the Republican Party. No, there's nothing inherently anti-democratic about restricting abortion. Um, so, so, so let's uh, tease that apart a little bit. I think that's 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 really helpful. Um, you know, where I certainly agree is that there is a notion of uh, what some political theorists like John Rawls would call a comprehensive liberalism, right? Where you're saying actually what it is to be a liberal is, uh, you know, to be very individualist, uh, to probably not be too faithful or religious, to have a kinds of lives in which you, you don't structure your conception of a good around ties to your family, ties to religious community, in which we're always sort of self-inventing individualists. And of course, um, in many ways, you and I are like that. In many ways, uh, sort of the elite of the United States and of many countries, um, we don't want to exaggerate the extent to which that's the case, but, but that is the way that a lot of highly educated, influential people live. We've moved around a lot, pursue opportunity, define themselves by their professions, define themselves by um their interests by 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 their political commitments rather than by those more community oriented things that they're born into the ties that were made for them without their choosing and i think there's something beautiful about that and uh also some limits to that but, but we can you know celebrate some people living their lives in that way trying to impose that on a society as a whole saying this is the right way to live and our institutions should encourage people to do that is obviously wrong. It is undemocratic because it's very unlikely that you're going to have a majority for it. It's actually also in a more important sense a liberal because it doesn't do what is the essence of political liberalism, which is to recognize uh, the freedoms of people to determine how they want to lead their lives, including the freedom to say, uh, I'm born into a particular community, I'm born into a particular family, I'm born into a particular religious faith, and I'm going to prioritize those ties over everything else. I will never make a decision to self-create ab nihilo at the age of 18. Um, I will simply continue to be bound by those ties, and that's what's going to give meaning and structure to my life. And that, in a politically liberal society, is as legitimate a choice um, as, as one that perhaps describes more how, how I've lived my life. Um, so far. So I think I think I agree with you that there is a way in which um, elites can start talking about liberalism that bleeds into this kind of comprehensive liberalism. Um, uh, and that that is a real danger, that that loses democratic legitimacy, and that actually, even though it invokes the idea of liberalism sometimes, or the idea of individualism, uh, it is actually uh, deeply illiberal. Um, I guess I nevertheless worry about uh two things and 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 the first is that uh normatively giving up on uh more basic individual rights right he is not sort of celebrating the individual's lifestyle but the basic right to free worship the basic right to free expression expression 
um, the basic right uh, to uh, 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 contest the ruling values of a society, um, uh, the basic uh, amount of tolerance towards you um, if you're in an ethnic or religious minority group um, sort of goes a little bit beyond the democratic minimalism, right? So, yeah. um, uh, you know, what would you say of situations, uh, as in Egypt, actually, where there's a significant religious minority? Um, you know, in Egypt, I believe, is about 10% of um, yeah. Coptic Christians, something like that in the society, who suffer really terrible oppression from society at large. Now, perhaps they can run political parties. Perhaps they can, uh, you know, assemble uh, uh, in the public square for political demonstrations. But when their ability to to worship, their ability to um, uh, uh, be true to their conception of how they want to lead their life is massively threatened by a majoritarian democratic government that says, hey, we have 90% of the population, so we can just tell you what to do and we can close down your churches and we don't have to protect them when people try to burn them down. Um, that doesn't necessarily violate the kind of minimalist uh, uh, democratic conception you have, but it does violate my values and I think the rights of those people in such an extreme way, but it doesn't seem to me obvious what regime to choose, right? Like if that's the nature of the liberal democratic government we're talking about, then I just refuse to choose between um, some kind of undemocratic liberal regime that uh, has relatively minimal political prosecution and some kind of you know ideal scenario um, and doesn't really allow for free elections but has respect towards that ten percent of people and a government that's democratically legitimated but that oppresses ten percent of people in really terrible ways perhaps up to and including um, uh, uh, you know them suffering real forms of violence that that, that just feels to me like you know, a Sophie's choice, but I'm but I'm not willing to make. So so what would you say normatively in a circumstance like that? Are you are you sort of clear that one of those governments is better than the other? I'm glad you put it in such stark fashion because that does sort of force us to consider what we would do in this circumstance. And first of all, I don't think it's likely that you have these sort of ideal type options. Obviously, this is a hypothetical. I think in practice, you know, we wouldn't have a choice quite like that. But there, let's say we did. The democratic option would in some ways be preferable because you could always undo the bad policies of, let's say, closing down a certain number of churches. I think it would be very difficult to close down all churches because there still is an Egyptian constitution. And let's keep in mind that when we're talking about majorities doing a lot of what they want to do, they still are constrained by whatever constitution there is in their country. Um, unless we're talking about a place where, you know, there is um, the, the constitution isn't set in stone or they're drafting something new and that would be maybe a little bit different. So, you know, at least in that context, you you would still have a constitutional framework that would introduce some guardrails against very extreme actions. And obviously, of course, you can amend constitutions, usually with a supermajority of some sort. But to be fair, you can do that even in America. Like theoretically, if you um, I guess you could find a way to like ban Muslims from political office if you had a large enough number uh, of votes to amend different parts of the constitution. And, you know, sure, that but at that make... point, America becomes exactly the kind of a liberal democracy that I object to, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But, you know, but the, the difference is the benefit of the democratic option is that, you know, some people would see the dangers of closing down churches and they would see that their Christian colleagues or friends or relatives are having a very hard time under this government and then that they would be able to organize and oppose this course of events they would be able to make their case to the electorate in the subsequent election that this has gone too far and there must be another way this is the right to recourse there is no right to recourse even under a benevolent dictatorship um the there is no avenue for redress. So for me, the avenue of redress is really at the heart of the democratic idea. And as long as long as that's there, uh, 
you never completely lose hope. The other thing I would say about the Christian minority in a country like Egypt, it depends what we think about when we think about minority rights. So um, Egypt has its own version of identity politics, which sees Christians primarily just as Christians. So or women only as women. So you focus on things that have to do specifically with gender or Christian worship. But Christians also deserve the right to vote. Christians deserve the right to elect their representatives. Christians deserve the right to protest and to form political parties and to write a letter to the editor in the newspaper that criticizes the government. So it depends do we see Christians only in so far as their Christian identity is paramount? Or is there a set of other rights that have to do with democratic contestation that many Christians also want? And even a liberal benevolent autocracy that is supposedly pro-Christian would deny them uh, those basic rights of democratic contestation. So I agree with that, which is why I'm not I'm not arguing that one is superior to the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but I guess I'm 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 skeptical that one that you think is superior is superior either. And and one of the reasons is that um, I agree with you about the right to contestation. That is absolutely fundamental in a democracy. It's one of the reasons why I'm so worried about restrictions on free speech, both internationally and within Western liberal democracies, because um, uh, you need the freedom of speech in order to be able to contest the next election. Uh, in a way that's fair. And when people think that losing access to the government might lose them access to the ability to make their case at the next election, you lose the pacifying power of the democratic mechanism because then elections come to be all or nothing uh, in a way that's really, really worrying. So, so I agree with that train of thought. I guess I would worry that as political scientists like Donald Horowitz have pointed out, uh, you know, there are some societies that are just very divided along pretty stable uh, ethnic or religious lines. There are some tribal societies in sub-Saharan Africa in which, you know, parts of a very long time have pitted one tribe against another tribe or against a set of other tribes. Um, there's you know, societies within the Middle East that are very divided between Sunnis and, and Shias. There's societies that are divided between Muslims and Christians and so on. And um, in those societies, if you happen to be in a clear minority, you know, the ability to make an appeal to your fellow citizens is just very limited, right? The, the, the yeah. hope that you're going to be able to somehow just induce a change of mind in enough people who are just on the other side of this very deep, very long-standing, stark political cleavage. So that suddenly we're saying, oh, you know, the members of this outgroup are really treated in a bad way and let's change how we rule, um, is it, sort of sufficiently theoretical. It, it, it is sort of far enough removed from society, but that right to recourse just isn't very meaningful in in in, in practice. And um, in circumstances in which some minority group has been horribly oppressed, that feels like a fair description of the situation. So I guess, you know, to go back to, to Egypt or to go, you know, to think about a case like, um, you know, the United States when African-Americans didn't have voting rights, um, uh, uh, you know, does that, uh, uh, you know, does that right uh, to contest in an abstract way when you're pretty sure you're going to fall on deaf ears and when the daily circumstances of your life are really perilous and and violate, you know, your moral interest in being able to worship as you please, you know, does that really compensate for, for those things in a big enough way that we're comfortable with that kind of political system? Yeah, so it becomes more complicated <clears throat> in in certain kinds of ethnically and tribally divided societies, and you've obviously written a lot about this. But it also, I think, shows itself, and I'll get to those most, more serious cases in a moment, but I think it's also worth mentioning that even in advanced, quote-unquote, properly liberal democracies, you see this dilemma in a very stark way, for example, in Switzerland, with the ban on minarets. So that if you have a Muslim house of worship, you cannot have a minaret at a certain height and that sort of thing. And that was passed by popular referendum. That's almost like a perfect encapsulation of, wow, that's very democratic. People are getting to choose on something very specific. And then they chose illiberally, obviously in a way that, um, in a way that was clearly, you know, anti, anti-Muslim or in France, the 2004 law on conspicuous religious symbols, 
which I would argue specifically targeted Muslims, even though that's not that's not ex exactly in the text of the legislation. But in effect, the people who wear conspicuous religious symbols and consider it an obligation in their faith are Muslims. And, uh, and so we're talking here about restrictions on wearing the headscarf in state institutions and in certain um, certain levels of public education. So um so what do we say about that? I mean, I, there's no way to avoid this. And I'm someone who has been very critical about the French legislative measures that seem to single out Muslims. But at the same time, if I want to be faithful to my own set of principles, I have to say that if this is what the majority of French people seem to prefer and want, that is a law of the land and we have to respect it. We can argue against it and Muslims in France do argue against it. And <clears throat> I hope that one day they'll be able to persuade their fellow French country people to, to think differently. But, you know, and this the Swiss minaret ban, what can I say about that? That's pretty scary. Imagine something comparable um, in the US. Now, I think that in the case of countries that are not advanced, democracies obviously there's a real there's a real tension here and the stakes are higher it's not just about oh you can't have a minaret but um in that case i think my answer is not going to be satisfying to a lot of people you have to let the democratic process play out i can't guarantee substantively good outcomes before the process is in motion we can we can hope for things we can push for things but ultimately um, as we had in our own country, you pointed out that, you know, until the 1960s, according to certain political science definitions, was the U.S. an actual democracy? Did it actually have universal suffrage in the full sense of the word of the words universal suffrage? So if America wasn't able to avoid that as recently as the 1960s, then we're going to have to, I think, realize that there is going to be some of that push and pull in a country like Egypt, but I don't know, I don't know what else we could do. Like, what's the other option? The other option is just to say, well, let's stick with what we know that these, these more culturally secular or liberal um, autocracies that actually provide protections on, on certain women's rights and minority rights, even though they're bad on everything else. I mean, that's one option, but then you never start the process of moving towards democracy and then you'll say that Arabs are never ready because they haven't become liberal. So I, I also worry about the sequentialism. If you prioritize liberalism, I find that in, in effect, you folks end up, they end up pushing democracy further out into the future. And this is actually what a lot of enlightenment philosophers and intellectuals argued for precisely. If we look at the genesis of the liberal idea, these are people who were very skeptical of mass politics. They were very skeptical of universal suffrage. Um, the founding fathers were very skeptical of, of democracy in this sense. And you can just go back and look at what John Adams or James Madison said about democracy. And it's pretty intense rhetoric. And I don't think Americans are fully aware of that. So you, if you start to see the masses as potentially capable of shutting down churches and you assume they're going to go in that direction, then you're going to say, well, Egyptians aren't ready yet. We have to inculcate into them liberal values, and then we can get to democracy in a decade or three. So that's what I worry that in effect, we end up going down that, that um, path of argument. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you said you had a tragic view of human history, but I feel like my view of human nature, of human history may be more tragic than yours in this respect, because, uh, you know, it feels to me that there's a choice between two deeply tragic things. As I pointed out at the beginning, I think those quote-unquote liberal regimes aren't really liberal at all. Hosni Mubarak was not a liberal. I mean, he may have allowed a right. little bit more religious freedom than the Muslim Brotherhood would have, but in other accounts, he wasn't just anti-democratic, which he obviously was. He was illiberal, right? He yeah. tortured people and threw them in jail for what they said. Um, you know, he, you know, wanted his, his army shoot at protesters. That's that's not a liberal at all. So, um, I would distinguish between a debate in foreign policy about the extent to which we should 
support the supposedly liberal dictatorships of the Middle East against democratic challenges, which may uh, lead to illiberal, often Islamist movements winning, on which I think broadly I sympathize with your instincts, um, from the sort of more high-level theoretical question of should we have a principled preference for illiberal democracy over, you know, supposedly so undemocratic, supposedly liberalism, which actually often is not particularly liberal. And and it just seems to me in that in that scenario, the forms of undemocratic liberalism aren't really going to be liberal, which means that I don't have much sympathy for them. And the forms of liberal democracy aren't really going to be democ- democratic most of the time, which g- gives me very limited sympathy for them either. And so that's why my view, I think, is more tragic than yours, because it feels to me that once you start taking a significant hit on either side of that equation. And we're not talking about my favorite immigration policy or even my favorite rules of abortion. I'm talking about um, you know, deviations from, from the basic set of liberalism of individual rights and, and, and um, uh, separation of powers and so on that you need to sustain a democratic system. Uh, you know, at that point, I just think that once you start going far enough down uh, 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 you know, in a bad direction on one side of the equation, you're going to end up going really far down on the other equation too. Um, and and so perhaps let me push you on that one step yeah. further. You now, what's an example of a illiberal democracy um, that has actually uh, sustained itself in a meaningful way over time um, and in which the violations of individual rights were not so blatant that we would have real trouble tolerating it. Um, and again, I, I I don't mean, you know, uh, places where we think, uh, uh, you know, um, which don't accord with, with, with you and mine preference for the full range of, uh, you know, comprehensive liberal rights. Um, I'm talking about places where, uh, you know, there was democratic movements that really were majoritarian in a very, very significant way that might be equivalent to the kind of fears you might have about the Muslim Brotherhood coming to power in Egypt or elsewhere. Where did that work out for, for the democratic element in yeah. the society? Where did that actually lead to, uh, you know, an imperfect democracy over time or even a society that eventually um, gave more rights to to the minorities within, within that society? Yeah, well, I guess if, like the first thing I'd say just on, on the first point about whether we should have a principled preference for illiberal democracy. That is, it's not quite my argument in the sense that I don't expect the U S government in its foreign policy to ever kind of substantively commit to illiberal democracy. Um, What I would like them to commit to is just plain old democracy and then be agnostic on the outcomes in a more self-conscious way. So if if the democratic process produces Islamist victories, so be it. If it produces Marxist, leftist, liberal, nationalist outcomes, so be it. There should be no prejudice to any particular substantive outcome. We shouldn't even want there to be a particular outcome. And we should remove ourselves from the business of, of thinking what might be good for another country's voters and what they deserve or want or what they truly need that, you know, maybe they're under some kind of false consciousness. And if only America helps push them along through educational initiatives and whatever it might be. I mean, that's what I want to guard against any kind of, I want to bring back democracy promotion in the Middle East, but I want to avoid any hint of cultural and religious transformation. So that's just one thing I would say, but on your question, like what is a practical example of a successful uh, illiberal democracy. I don't know if you can guess what country I'm going to cite, <laughs> but I do think there is one that's quite impressive and quite successful, although people might take issue with me highlighting this country, Israel. Israel is the most successful illiberal democracy, probably as far maybe that we've had, that anyone's had in the modern period. So there's that. Now, there are interesting debates about with the most recent election in Israel where um, the most right wing. But but before we get to the last election, first of all, I mean, your your ability to make yourself unpopular is something (laughs) I I truly admire. And I mean, you know, 
I was going to say earlier that, you know, not only does the left consider you a tweet on Twitter because you disagree with some parts of a current discourse about the United States, which perhaps we'll get to later in our conversation, um, you seem to, you know, deliberately go against uh, the feeling in your own family, uh, an extended family in Egypt, as you were saying, you know, you're picking a fight with them. And, and now you're somehow managing to make Israel the 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 the, the, the striking example of a successful liberal democracy, which I'm sure doesn't make you more popular with uh with a lot of people either, but explain that argument before we get to the last election um, uh, uh, for people who know, may not know much about Israel. Why, yeah, yeah, why sure. is it in a liberal democracy and why is it in some ways a successful example of a liberal democracy, according to you? Yeah. By successful, I mean successful that it has survived and it has been successful, obviously, in terms of economic <clears throat> economic outcomes and people continue to have the right to vote. So you haven't seen an erosion which I think is a very legitimate concern that you raise, that over time, illiberal governments start to encroach on contestation. And luckily, Israel's democracy remains as vibrant and vigorous um, as it has been in recent decades. Of course, we're talking here about within the borders of Israel proper. I am not talking about the West Bank because Palestinians in the West Bank don't have the right to vote in Israeli elections. They're not Israeli citizens, and that's a different conversation. But in in the case of Israel, um, Arabs are, I'm comfortable saying, second-class citizens. And I'm very, very much opposed to that. I find that morally abhorrent, and I've been very critical of Israel on precisely those grounds. Um, Arabs have a limit to how much they can feel. They can be Israeli citizens, obviously, but they're their sense of their own citizenship is limited. I mean, the national anthem is specifically Jewish. That's a weird situation to be in. If you're an Arab citizen of Israel, but even the national anthem, you can't really relate to it. So on a symbolic level, you have issues like that. But then there's also when it comes to um, Arabs, Arabs, um, you know, don't serve in the military, again, for, for obvious and understandable reasons, that would put them in a pretty difficult position. But um, there are a number of benefits and preferences that um, that Jews, uh, Jewish citizens of Israel are able to receive. So, for example, um, if you marry an Arab who is not an Israeli citizen, that person um, may have a lot of difficulty becoming Israeli um, in a way that wouldn't be the case for a Jewish person in Israel who's marrying an American Jew. That person would be able to become uh, Israeli almost, you know, almost immediately. So um, so there's that sorts of things, just a kind of just a general there. There's just two levels of citizenship that, you know, at the same time, Arabs do have the right to vote. They do have significant representation in the Israeli parliament. And that is good. And they actually do have the right to recourse. They can vote on the local level. They can vote on the national level. They can impress upon their local representatives um, to provide more resources to disadvantaged Arab communities. They always have the option to exercise disagreement, anger, frustration through democratic contestation. That's sort of how I, I would describe the overall Israeli situation. But, um, you know, other examples, I think Indonesia is a case that I often make reference to. I do talk about it briefly in the book, that on the local level, you have Sharia ordinances that have been implemented in more religiously conservative regions. So it's definitely religiously and culturally illiberal. And it is also a vibrant democracy, not a perfect one. There are many flaws and some of them may, you know, may be heading in the wrong direction. Um, and then also... India is an interesting case. I don't know enough about it to um, to to kind of rule definitively on how bad or how good it is. Obviously, I'm very concerned about the disenfranchisement of the Muslim minority, um, and we'll have to see how that goes. But for the time being, um, uh, it, you know, India has not become an authoritarian state. Is it successful? Well, if you care about Muslim minority rights, as I do, I hesitate to call to really call India a success, a model. It's not for me to say it's a model or not, but just to say that you can you can remain a democracy even if you feature high levels of illiberalism. But let's, let's also remember that it's a continuum. There's no, if it's from zero to 10, 
we're not talking about either either you're at one extreme or the other. Countries go back and forth along the spectrum. France is not completely liberal, as I mentioned earlier. France does feature some illiberal components because of its state ideology, which is an aggressive form of secularism, for example. It, it seems to me that there's an interesting uh, uh, difference between these examples you you used, um, uh, where I would put sort of Israel and certainly with India on one side of it, and then put Indonesia on 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 the other. So, um, you know, what the situation in Israel is, as as you've described, and what agro situation in India is in a, in a different kind of way, um, is that there is a majority which actually is liberal within itself. Right. So in Israel, when you look at the Jewish population, um, even on religious matters, uh, the state of affairs is reasonably liberal. I know that there's some real issues about who counts as a Jew, depending on, you know, the sort of state rabbinate and so on. But, you know, effectively, you can be an Israeli citizen, a Jewish citizen of Israel and blaspheme. You can be a Jewish citizen of Israel and be completely secular. And all of that is fine. Right. So there's a, a liberal democracy in Israel for the majority of the population. And then you have illiberal uh, oppression, and we can argue about the exact description of it, but it's obviously an illiberal form of rule over the non-Jewish minority within the state. Um, and it may be that that, is, and I think India in a way is similar. I mean, the, the erosion of freedom of speech in India goes much further than in Israel for the majority population. Um, the oppression of Muslims within India is perhaps less uh, far advanced than it is in Israel. You can sort of draw distinctions, but effectively it is a reasonably liberal system for the majority, but then has illiberal treatment of the minority. And you might think that that is structurally a very different case from uh, you know what happens when an illiberal movement comes to power that wants to not just oppress this minority group, but they want to actually establish illiberal rules for the members of the ethnic or religious majority as well. Um, and I find I think I find it easier to see the trade-off in the majority minority case, right? It's easier to see, well, on the one hand, this is really terrible because it's this stable form of domination over the minority. On the other hand, um, you might have good outcomes for the majority and the system might be relatively stable precisely because for the majority of citizens, all of those forms of contestation and recourse and so on continue to exist. Um, so I guess does that generalize to what Egypt would have looked like under the Muslim Brotherhood, um, uh, where the form of illiberalism would not have just victimized Coptic Christians, as it likely would have done, but it would also have shut down a lot of contestation within the majority Muslim society. Um, and that's where Indonesia seems to me in some ways a more interesting uh, case, because there we are talking about a something like 90% Muslim society that does incorporate significantly illiberal elements, which bind the majority population. And yet, as you're saying, there's sort of this continuation of uh, democratic contestation in an imperfect but real way that has been sustained for, for a good number of decades at, at this point. So I guess, you yeah. know, um, yeah, does, does something like the case of Israel actually generalize to those other cases we've been talking about? And if not, uh, uh, you know, how much hope should we take from a case like Indonesia? Yeah. So on India, I think it's worth, you know, the ruling party, the BJP, um, is illiberal even when it comes to Hindus. So it, it obviously means something different in practice. But if we're talking about beef bans, I don't know if beef bans are the most important restriction on freedom that you can think about. But they they do lean illiberal in the sense that you are restricting someone's ability to make their own choice based on their own conscience, right? Um, and the BJP is a far right Hindu nationalist party, so um, I think we're gonna, I think we are seeing changes in what that means for Hindus. So maybe India is a sort of in between case. That that seems right. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know, I I think that. This is we won't talk about them because then we'll have too many examples, as you said. But um, there's elements of Hungary and Poland that might fit into that as well. That um, you know, uh, if you are a secular, atheist, anti-Christian, um, Hungarian 
but you're like a native Hungarian, like you won't like that an illiberal party came to power in, in Hungary. But Indonesia, I think, well, first of all, there's a difference between the national and, and the state level. So a lot of these illiberal elements have not been legislated nationally because there is decentralization and federalism. It allows certain certain regions that are more, let's say, religiously intense, they can pass local ordinances. Sometimes they get struck down constitutionally if they're under review. But I think there's also an interesting question to be had about to what extent decentralization and a, fed a federal approach fits into some of these debates that do we allow do we allow states within a broader polity to experiment based on their own particular circumstances? We might even have, an, you know, examples of that in the case of the U.S., where individual states introduce illiberal legislation on, um, for example, on abortion. And then you can sort of see with 50 states a kind of laboratory of democracy where different states experiment with different kinds of illiberal or liberal approaches to abortion. So, but yeah, Indonesia, I think, is is the instructive case because it is Muslim majority. But Indonesia is also, I think, by any reasonable standard, more, quote unquote, successful than Egypt is because it is democratic, because people do have people do have rights. People can vote and they can, you know, people can criticize the ruling government. I mean, so yeah, Indonesia is maybe not something that Muslims look at and are like, oh, we wish we could be Indonesia. I've actually not heard many people say that. <laughs> Unfortunately, they usually say, oh, if only we could be like Dubai, which is one of the most authoritarian regimes um, pretty much anywhere at this point. Um, so I don't know, it's a hard sell. But Indonesia is chaotic. It is messy. There are drawbacks, but at least there is a process in motion. And I think that's better than the alternative. There are no ideal choices. Again, like as you said, Yasha, in our ideal world, we would have everything that we wanted. But if, if you're telling me to choose, I think Indonesia is a better model than Egypt is or Jordan even. And Jordan is maybe a better example because it's not as authoritarian. It's more of a, a soft authoritarian regime. And the monarchy is quite progressive relative to the rest of the population. So I think that, you know, it is an interesting question to pose to people. Do you like the progressive autocratic monarchy with limited competition that Jordan has or the messy, chaotic, sometimes illiberal on the local level approach of Indonesia? It's it's always struck me that Indonesia is the most important country that the most educated people know the least about. Um, uh, and perhaps uh, given that uh, Indonesia now seems to be at the center of this debate for us, uh, we need to uh, contrive some kind of research trip to Indonesia in the months to come. <laughs> yes, by. indeed. Um, uh, going from Israel and Indonesia and India, uh, all the eyes, um, to, back to the United States, um, how does your reflection about the conflict between democracy and liberalism uh, and the way in which somebody like Donald Trump seems to uh, uh, threaten elements of our liberal system, I would say he also threatens elements of our democratic system, uh, inform your reflections on the United States. You know, once people have fought through this topic and, and the way you suggest, how do you think that should change uh, their reflections about what's going on in the United States today and, and how to effectively stand up for uh, our values uh, in the American context? Yeah. So, you know, as you know, some people think that my views on American democracy are odd, to put it mildly. And I think people don't always understand the context. Um, my starting premises are different. So I do draw on my experiences in the Middle East in a in a significant way. And I did see how, <clears throat> because I saw what happened during the Arab Spring, it makes me more sensitive to demonizing illiberal parties or individuals coming to power in the American case. So obviously Trump is not a religious illiberal, although obviously Christian nationalists seem to like him quite a bit, but um, he is someone who came to power through democratic means in 2016. And it forced, it forced us as Americans to think through some of these tensions. And I actually, 
I actually have said this publicly, so you know I'm I'm fine with saying it to you, Yasha. Pl you know, please don't judge me. But uh, you know, I did cry the night that um, Trump won in 2016 because I was talking to my brother late at night, and you know everyone was coming back from a devastating election party where people were like kind of just like crying or bawling. You know, I resisted, but then I come home, I talk to my brother, and I was like, I'm not afraid for what happens to me and you, Sharif. Sharif is my brother. I'm worried about mom and dad. My mom wears the headscarf. And Trump really had emphasized anti-Muslim rhetoric as part of his calling card. I mean, people forget it now because Trump doesn't seem to care about us Muslims anymore. There was a time he was obsessed. If there's right? one thing, if there's one good thing about Donald Trump, it's his short attention span. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But also, I mean, part of it is that the wokes sort of took the place of the Muslims as public enemy, you know? So we can thank the wokes for that. Um, so, you know, that was really frightening for me. Thank I'm, but I do feel a sense of relief that those four years were not as bad as my worst fears. I mean, let's not forget that Donald Trump was someone who talked about, he entertained in the kind of casual way that he does, you know, putting most American Muslims on a registry. That is crazy. Um, or refusing to condemn the, in, the internment of Japanese Americans. This, that like, that that's like at a different level. But when we actually look at what he did, I was able, I think, to feel some degree of, okay, democracy is working. Um, different parts of the country are pushing back. The Democratic Party is pushing back. They are defending Muslims. It was a beautiful sight when the Democratic Party finally got over its discomfort with associating with Muslims in part because under Obama, Obama was sort of Muslim, according to some people. So he didn't want to present himself in that way. But post-2016, the Democratic Party pushes back hard. And that was great. But um, and our democracy survived. People criticize me for not anticipating the insurrection on January 6th. I'm I'm OK with saying that I did not predict that because I don't think really anyone predicted something quite like that. And if you did, I imagine it was probably a fluke. Um, so, no, I did not. I did not think that was going to happen. And that was frightening to me. And it showed that the Republican Party was worse than I expected on when it came to commitment to democracy. But I don't think it is appropriate to demonize Republicans writ large. We we have a two party system. So if one party doesn't do well or is messing things up and people want to choose the other option, that's their right without saying that anyone who votes for the GOP in 2022 is a fascist or is helping democracy die. And I'm not being hyperbolic here. This this has been the argument from a growing number of Democrats and liberals in the American context that if you vote for the other party, you are playing a direct role in bringing democracy to an end. This is why this sort of apocalyptic rhetoric that I think has become the norm is dangerous because it delegitimizes normal democratic contestation. And, you know, the Democratic Party is basically saying to people, even if you don't like our policies on inflation on public education, on wokeness, on gender identity, which is obviously, you know, a thing that's, um, you know, bothering a lot of people of color, especially Arabs, Muslims, Hispanics, and so forth. If you don't like all of our policies, you still have to vote for us because democracy is on the ballot and there is only one choice, us. To me, that is contrary to the democratic spirit. That's part of the argument that I've been making. People seem, some people seem to hate this argument. So we can unpack that, but that's like part of, you know, um, and I did when I came back to the U.S. in 2014 from the Middle East, I saw echoes of how people talked about Trump and the deplorables and how people talked about Mohammed Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood. This idea that you have liberal and secular elites who are better educated, they think they know it's better for everyone. They see a democratic result they don't like, in this case, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and they say, look. Demo if democracy is good, it should lead to good outcomes. But, but this is not a good outcome. Therefore, you know, then whatever. And I saw something similar post 2016. And I think there was an effort to delegitimize Trump almost from the get go. We don't have to get into Russiagate. But the fact that we've memory hold an entire two year process 
um, that really didn't come up with certainly nothing that reached a criminal level. Um, so yeah, Trump was bad. He had inappropriate relations with Russians, but did that lead to a, you know, did it rise to a criminal, you know, a level of criminal activity? Apparently not. So there were these things that Democrats so easily forget that I think soured a lot of Republicans and Trump voters from 2016 onwards. They saw that as being fundamentally disrespectful of their right to vote for Donald Trump. We as liberals and members of the Democratic Party never came to terms with Donald Trump as the legitimate president. So there's 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 a good number of points here that I that I agree with. Starting with uh, something you didn't mention, but 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 I'm sure would would agree on the sort of real push to try and convince members of the electoral college to vote yeah. for Hillary Clinton rather than Donald Trump, uh, which, which would in effect have been an anti-democratic push. And there's real voices, um, you know, in between November of 2016 and January of 2017. Uh, trying to push for that. Um, I agree with you on the importance to distinguish between the danger posed by a politician, uh, by a populist leader like Donald Trump, and the kind, and I think that we should be very upfront and very clear about that, um, and the demonization of anybody who voted for him. Um, You know, good people and decent people can vote for warring political candidates for all kinds of complex reasons. And I think in a democracy, um, the response to many, many, many millions of your compatriots supporting a political force like that is not to say you're all evil human beings. It is to make them a political offering that allows them to um, to change their mind and to vote for your party, hopefully, the next time around. Um, uh, I agree with you that one of the really uh, uh, st- big strategic mistakes of the Democratic Party in the last few years has been that right at the moment when democratic institutions, I think, are threatened in a significant way, they have become more politically extreme rather than more politically moderate, forcing people to make this choice between uh, you know, supporting a candidate that many Republicans, many conservatives don't particularly love, um, and embracing ever more radical policies uh, that, that they object to in a deep moral, moral way. I think that was a big strategic mistake. I also agree with you that we should take the threat to democracy seriously, but the way in which uh, uh, you know, uh, even the midterm elections have now been sort of portrayed as, uh, you know, the definitive battle over the future existence of democracy in the United States, of a way in which uh, people having different kinds of political opinions is sometimes explained as, you know, they're just victims of misinformation. That's the only possible reason, for example, why, you know, black men might not vote uh, for yeah. a particular uh, gubernatorial candidate and so on. On all of those kinds of things, I think we 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 agree. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. If you have no, totally, I agree. Yeah. Um, but but there are two sort of fundamental ways in which I would push back against your 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 argument, which echo perhaps the international conversation we've had, unsurprisingly. Uh, and the first would be uh, uh, to doubt that the reason why Donald Trump didn't do more damage uh, has to do with the, uh, you know, is indication of the possible longevity and the relative merit of an illiberal democracy. Because I think one of the things that has stopped Donald Trump from uh, a lot of really bad things he could have done normatively and uh, of quite effective attacks on our institutions is the extent to which America is a liberal democracy, to which we have a very deep separation of powers, to which we have a constitution, to which the Supreme Court is able to come and step in uh, when constitutional rights are violated. Um, and it seems to me that, uh, you know, without those kind of liberal constraints, not, you know, liberal policy, uh, yeah, you know, just just enshrined in, in something, but, but liberal political constraints of judicial review, of independent institutions, of fundamental rights for individuals, of uh, prohibitions on the state, uh, to discriminate between its citizens on the basis of the race and ethnicity and uh, religion and so on. That is why we didn't end up with some of those worst outcomes that I think you rightly feared in, in November 2016. So I would argue that actually our resilience against Trump is particularly is, is, is actually um, a part of a plea for why we need liberal democracy is rightly understood. And conversely, um, I don't think anybody can blame you for not having predicted January 6th. I didn't predict January 6th. I agree with you that insofar as anybody did, it was probably, uh, as philosophers would put it, a, a, you know, 
um, a matter of true belief rather than of knowledge. They simply happen to uh, come up with that outcome. I don't think anybody really had understood the mechanisms um, to that extent. But it shows that this liberal Democrat, as you would describe him, actually isn't willing to continue ruling in a democratic manner um, if the constraints weren't there. Clearly, if there hadn't been those constraints on the power of Donald Trump, he would have stayed in office after losing a democratic election. And that, I think, uh, is uh, another good signal that those but that kind of option just isn't actually there, that a truly liberal democracy just won't sustain itself because whether it's a Muslim country like Egypt or whether it's a majority Christian country like the United States, those kind of liberal democratic leaders will eventually quash even the democratic element. Yeah, it's a good point on Trump. And that's actually why I wouldn't call Trump an illiberal Democrat when it comes down to it for precisely the reason that you mentioned. Trump, I suppose, would be considered an illiberal anti-democrat, um, where I actually think that in some ways, parts of the Republican Party in America are worse than the Muslim Brotherhood. I think that the Muslim Brotherhood, by and large, is more committed to procedural democracy than the Republican Party appears to be now. I mean, that's maybe a bigger debate. But I, that's why I do think we should put pressure on people. And when I do talk to right wing audiences, um, I do try to, you know, put this back in just reverse. So when I talk to Democrats, I'm like, guys, we got to be self-critical about our own side. If Trump wins or someone like him in 2024, fair, fair and square, we have to find a way to live with that outcome and fight and, and live to fight another day through the ballot box. But when I talk to right wingers, I also expect the same from them, that I want them to make a commitment that if Biden or whoever's going to run as a Democrat in 2024 wins clearly, um, that they have to recognize that person's legitimacy, which unfortunately they do not appear to have done, at least many of them haven't appeared to have done with Joe Biden. So I think that if we if we focus on my on democratic minimalism, it gives us it allows us to sharpen our focus and to talk about the procedural mechanisms that have to be protected. And it allows us to sort of cordon off some of the superfluous conversations. Now, I think you're right that separation of powers is a great thing about American democracy. And I would actually, I'm, I'm very much in favor of creating institutional mechanisms in young democracies uh, where, where there is that balance of power between different institutions. And that's where constitution drafting really matters. And so... And there's no reason to think that, you know, if Egypt had, well, Egypt's constitution that was drafted in um, in 2012 did have significant separation of powers. Was it enough? But I think that most new constitutions do acknowledge checks and balances. They aren't necessarily concentrating power in the hands of one person. So I th I'm all in favor of that. But those are those are mechanisms. They're about means. They're not about substantive ends. They're not about the good life. Like what I'm most concerned about, I don't want Americans or America abroad to tip the scale on what the good life consists of. But when it comes to procedural mechanisms, should the U.S. put pressure on Egypt 10 years from now to make sure that in a new constitution that the president doesn't have too much power and that that there should be a parliamentary system where you can actually have coalition governments that share power? Yes, because what does that do? It lowers the stakes of politics. Part of the problem in the U.S., there's, there is such, um, there's, there's a race for the prize. The prize is the state. The prize is the presidency. And whoever gets that thinks they can then transform the culture. So we, I would wish we didn't have a presidential system in some ways. I mean, you've talked about how, look, be careful what you wish for because parliamentary systems create their own problems. But I think the winner takes all nature of our political system is also an institutional problem as well. No, I, I think I, 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 I do agree with that. Um, uh, let me ask you a last question. Um, how optimistic should we be about democracy if we accept your kind of set of minimalist condition for for democracy 
Should that make us more optimistic about democracy flourishing uh, in the Middle East, about democracy surviving in the United States? Um, what do you think the, the 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 state of democracy in the world will look like in you know twenty five or fifty years? Well, first of all, it makes it easier to promote because if we can have a message where we say we're not asking you to change culturally or religiously, we're we're talking about procedural mechanisms that serve the purpose of regulating conflict. Because ultimately, what do diverse, divided societies need throughout the world? They need a regular system for managing conflict. And an electoral competition is the best way to do that. And that's something that any any people, any culture is capable of embracing. Now, the practice is obviously difficult, but I think that that's an easier thing to explain and justify. And once you start you know, uh, backfilling a lot of liberal progressive ideas. And that happens a lot when we talk to folks abroad. You know, we start to include things about gender equality. And how are you focusing on gender equality when you haven't even established, you know, a basic working democratic system, at least like get things in order, then you can start to like make the case for cultural change or whatever it might be. So I think that it has an appeal when it comes to foreign policy. Um, and that's also helpful in the fight against, you know, countries like China and Russia to say that, you know, we're going to be vigorous about democracy. We're going to we're going to reclaim our faith in the democratic idea. And that's partly I mean, even people who disagree with the specifics of my argument, I would like to think they'd be open to the idea that America shouldn't lose faith in itself. We are still a democracy, however flawed. And we do have some moral superiority. I do believe we are better than authoritarian countries and authoritarian society. So once we recognize the power of the democratic idea, even if we disagree on the specifics, we should take that in how in how we operate elsewhere. And I, it does hurt me to see so many of my fellow liberals basically saying, well, we shouldn't be talking about democracy or promoting it abroad until we get our own house in order. Come on, this is absurd. This is absurd. First of all, it could take a long time for us to get our house in order. And you know what? We might not get our house in order. So you're going to wait until when? Like 40 years from now? So we have to acknowledge that democracy is not a panacea. And this is this argument is also my way of lowering people's expectations because part of the problem is that we've projected such a burden on the democratic idea and it's a burden that it can no longer carry. Democracy doesn't give us all these other things that we like. Even when Biden says democracy should lead to consensus, democracy should be a path towards unity, democracy should work in quotation marks, it should deliver results. Actually, you know what? Democracies don't always deliver good results economically, for example. But we've given people the impression that democracy will lead to those outcomes. So, of course, they're disappointed. But if we say that, you know, let's lower our sights, democracy actually is not about all those other things. It can be. And on average, in many, and many often it, it does actually produce better economic outcomes. But those outcomes are never for, for ordained. And that's a hard pill for people to swallow. But I think it is a more realistic way of approaching something. And it just also, it's a way of liberating people to not expect so much from their politics, which is maybe a different topic, but we think politics is where we solve everything. It's not. Shadi, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Asha. Thanks for having me.